to do that tasting today, oh, the people. same amount of people, the same amount of wine would be over a million dollars. Yeah. What? You know that in 10 years, it will be yeah. at least double. So then I changed the price immediately after that to 16,000. It went to 19,000. Then I had it on the list for, I think, 28,000 because I thought I'm never going to replace this wine. Yeah, you can't and, get another and one. And you know right? what? If it doesn't sell it, you know, maybe one day I'll drink it or something. Yeah, we lost, you know, we lost 16,000 bottles of wine. We lost our entire restaurant wine cellar, which at the time was, um, you know, taking 20 odd years to put together. Did you try one of the bottles that was burnt just to see if it created some sort of magic under <laughs> the, the ones boil? The didn't explode, I guess. Well, yeah. it's interesting. Um, we. We are sitting down for part two of our chat with Martin Spedding from 10 Minutes by Tractor. Um, if you haven't listened to the first part, please go back. It's a deep dive into Chardonnay and we actually opened a bottle, which is now out. But as we sit here today drinking a, a glass that didn't exist in the world, which was super special. So thanks for that, Martin, and welcome back. No worries. Lovely to be here. Even though it's been three minutes in between <laughs> us chatting. Um, but an important three minutes because in front of us now we have uh, your Pinot, which, yep. um, you know, that's... I don't want to say that that's what I know you for, but it yep. is personally. That's yep. what that's what I'm going to grab a, a, a bottle of ten minutes by tractor. I'm getting one of your pinots. Um, this episode is going to focus on uh, you as a winemaker, uh, your story about getting into the vineyard, how you ended up in, uh, mm. as the owner, and also uh, personally, I'd like to know. Uh, we know about we've heard some secret stories about your personal cellar, mm -hmm. which yep. we would love to get into. <laughs> yeah. um, and, uh, and also the restaurant as well, um, yeah. how you turned it into an experience. So that's what you can expect on this episode. Um, Carlos Santos sitting next to me, how are you mates? I'm good, I'm good, very excited for for this Pinot tasting and obviously Martin's story, uh, which which I know fairly well. But uh, yeah, uh, very, very excited to have you here. Thank you so much for making time to come and see us. Not at all, great to be here. Can you take us through what we're going to be tasting at the start? Yeah, well, I thought it'd be interesting to start with our estate, uh, estate Pinot. This is from 2021. And um, in 2017, again, one of those moments in, in the winery uh, where we decided to sort of uh, break a little bit with the tradition and um, decided to do something new. And um, we are fortunate to have a uh, collection of vineyards that are spread across the peninsula and the peninsula is a uh, you know um, is, an, is an amazing place obviously for those that have visited you know surrounded by water uh, so maritime the maritime climate is a strong influence we have you know the the, the lower sort of uh, parts of the peninsula as you're coming in from the north you know reaching right up of course to Arthur's seat and uh, you know the rolling hills of uh, Main Ridge and and Red Hill um, you have the western port on one side the bay on the other um, the deep valleys the differences the soils the soils are incredibly different as you move across the peninsula mm. so it really is a an amazing tapestry of microclimates and terroir which from a wine point making point of view is really interesting mm. uh, and you know when we receive into the winery um, the grapes from each of our vineyards uh, we have around 10 vineyards where we uh, take uh, uh, where we have grapes from nine nine that have pinot um, they all obviously speak very much to their site and their you know the sub region that they come from and we used to put this wine together into a single wine just called the Estate Pinot, um, which was our, like our reserve level. So we have our 10X uh, label, then our estate, and then our single vineyards. And um, there was always a very distinct difference, of course, of what we're getting from up the hill, as we call it, and what we're getting from down the hill mm. uh, in those lower parts. And so... Um, I'd been thinking about it for a few years, but basically in 2017 decided to split the wine, make a uh, retailer's life uh, and sommelier's <laughs> life really hard uh, <laughs> by uh, just designating uh, one as uh, up the hill Literally and down the, the hill. hill yeah. Well, I thought about it, you know, some you know some fancy French terms for you know up and down <laughs> and all the rest <laughs> yeah. of it. But uh, Makes at the end sense. at the end of the day, it's just up and down, and and it really is um, just showing really at this level what you know some of those differences we see stylistically between 
um, you know, what we're growing, say, down in Turong, mm -hmm. you know, Muradak sort of region, uh, you know, Hastings region, uh, versus what we're growing up the top. And I think it's fascinating. So what, you, what we do here is sort of in the glasses, so what, what, what you see what you'd expect. Mm -hmm. And so down, uh, uh, sorry, up the hill is the one on the left. Mm -hmm. um, and you're starting there with a higher, so it's a little bit more red-fruited, it's a little bit more... Um, sort of finer, almost sort of mineral type tannins. You tend to get a little bit more spice and sort of almost autumnal characters, sometimes a poppery sort of mm, character. I agree, yeah. And very sort of lovely, fine sort of detail. So a very sort of a prettier style of uh, Pinot, whereas down the hill, um, what you'd expect, it's a little, um, a little bit more darker fruited, so a little mm. bit more darker cherry. Mm. You've got more of a brooding style of Pinot, which has more got some of those more earthy undertones, and you've got a bit more, you've got more tannin mm. and grippier tannin. So, mm. you know, structurally mm. quite different wines, and you can see. I, I can taste the difference. Yeah, definitely. I'm a down the hill yeah. guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I, you know, I'm not even saying because Carlos thinks I have sort of a bias towards Shiraz, and this does feel like a bit more. Uh, Grippy, yeah, yeah, a little yeah, bit more exactly. structure. It's certainly, but, it's certainly going to suit anyone that's used to sort of bigger tannin wines. Uh -huh. It's certainly going to find the oh, down nice. the hill. Yeah, wow, well, definitely that's, taste, definitely a difference in taste. And, so. and, and it's great that you separated them because, for example, for me, I, I go for the up the hill. Mm. I go for the for that more, um, I don't know, uh, that foresty and slight mm. dried leaf, more autumnal, as you say, more slight mushroom almost. Um, yeah. and I, I can see this evolving into the in, in years. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, when down the hill is, is more, um, yeah, just a yeah, common well, guy. I don't like to look down and the people just, <laughs> just the every day yeah. look, <laughs> looking up at my heroes yeah. in wine. Well, uh, you know, we have the single vineyard wines, which of course tell the story of a vineyard and you can do an up, up and yeah. down the hill, uh, exercise, which yeah, we will, we will, yeah. we will do next. Yeah. We will look at an up, mm. up and hill, up the hill, single vineyard wine and a down the hill, single vineyard wine. But what's interesting here, Angus, is that you've got like the up the hill, we've probably got four or five vineyards that contributed to that wine oh. down the hill. We've got two, two vineyards, which have contributed to that wine. And I do think all your vineyards. So, uh, no, we don't own them all, but we either lease them or own them. Right, yeah. 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 And, um, yeah, and I think it really tells the story of Mornington. You know, it's, uh, it's not, uh, I think some of the, resi the resistance of some people to talk about sub-regional characters is because, you know, uh, you know, if there's a concern that, you know, one region is seen as being better than another, uh -huh. whereas I see, you know, Pinot's as being just, uh, you can love the differences. I do like to find out what a winemaker believes is their unique um, difference in <laughs> winemaking. What is it something that stands 10 minutes by tractor out from the rest that you're doing in the, well, it might be Imogen, or it might be yourself as a collaboration. What have you discovered um, mm. along your journey that makes you stick out? Well, that's a, that's a very, <laughs> thanks for that question. Yeah, it's hard to, it's hard to talk yourself up, but it, it's nice to hear it what is. you think you're doing different. Well, look, it's, it's, um, I think like always in, you know, with anything in any business, it's, uh, a combination of, you know, um, uh, you know, good research and I suppose diligence, um, you know, finding the right sites, finding the right place to do what you want to do. It's all of those things with a bit of good luck and good fortune as well that's thrown in, you know. it's a, Some people were, you know, very lucky to stumble across, you know, uh, you know a, a great piece of dirt and to uh, plant a vineyard there. Others did all the work and maybe found a piece of dirt and maybe it wasn't as good as they hoped it would be. Um, and the very humbling thing about this industry is that, you know, you can be working in it for 20, 30 years, but, you know, it's not long enough to really mm. to to know everything you'd like to know and to um, do everything you'd like to do. So it's very, um, it's a, there's, a, there's a fair bit of good luck in there mm. as well. You have one it, shot, you have one shot each year, isn't yeah. it? A bit so like, well, like, again, 30, you know, 40 Philip, years. Philip mentioned his, you know, dad and Dave story with, uh, oh, yeah, you know, the, and finding, <laughs> the fire, yeah, the and fire. Fi and, you know, and finding himself stuck beside a, a cutting, you know, and, and mm. that's a, that was a great story for me because uh, mm. I think there is that a little bit of serendipity in there. 
I mean, actually, I was gonna, I was gonna go through uh, how did that go with the fire? So, 2018, how did that <laughs> it's happen? It's actually a great mix because uh, the fire story of yeah, Jones. That's, and, that's what that's what brought me to the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so you're not like, a man without you know <laughs> flames in his life. Yeah, well, you know, in 2018, we had a had a fire at our um, at our uh, restaurant cellar door site, which was with the old Apple Cool Shed, which we uh, stored a lot of wine and equipment and old tractors and. Uh, just about everything in and uh, yeah, we had a fire and there it's sort of uh, the result of that was we had to close our cellar door and restaurant for a couple of years. Um, it was, uh, we were very fortunate. No one was, uh, you know, badly hurt Jordan, and, yeah. uh, which was good, but, um, yeah, it is interesting how something like that can sort of derail you in a way. It, it's sort of, um, off the back of that, we started a process of, uh, rebuilding and, um, and so we rebuilt the restaurant and rebuilt our cellar door. But uh, yeah, so what has it done for us? It's sort of uh, we we now have, I suppose, uh, the silver, the little bit of the silver lining is we have some wonderful, you know, new facilities. Uh, you know, for a new a cellar door, it's still not a very big cellar door, but it's a, you know, finally got a, a dedicated mm. space for that. We've got some, a, you know, beautiful space for the. For the restaurant and things, but uh, yeah, we lost a you know we lost sixteen thousand bottles of wine. We lost uh, our entire uh, restaurant um, wine cellar, which at the time was um, you know taking twenty odd years to put together. Um, and so we had to start again from scratch. But it was uh, you know from these things you know um, you uh, there's a lot of learning and there's a lot of growth and resilience, obviously that. Uh, uh, comes out of that. So we reopened uh, uh, the restaurant in the end of 19 and the cellar door in January of 20. But of course, then we went into COVID Coffee, for a couple yeah. of years. So it's, um, yeah, it's been a challenging few years, four years or so since the fire, but it has been for everybody. Mm. But probably uh, the extra sort of uh, fire, uh, yeah. sort of aspect of the fire and the impact of that, of course, uh, it was uh, quite significant at the time. Did you try one of the bottles that was burnt just to see if it created some sort of magic under the, the oil? The ones that didn't explode, I guess. Well, yeah. it's interesting. Um, we, oh, I don't know if we've got time to tell a story. <laughs> yeah, but, please. <laughs> I'll tell you. I'll tell you one story anyway. There was a lot of good wine, obviously, that was lost. Um, the building, uh, the building had asbestos in it and things, so we uh, it was very hard to recover wine. But we actually the um, the restaurant cellar was actually a cool room. That we, we built within the building, so it was a it mm -hmm. was a room, room within, within a room, a, a room yeah. within a, a room. walk in kind of yeah. thing. Yeah. So um, the reality is, what uh, even though there was a lot of wine that was outside of that that cool room, um, other wine that um, was just lost directly in the fire. It was really only at the very end when the roof collapsed and broke into the cool room that. Um, water and smoke and things got in and so there was a lot of bo obviously a lot of bottles that were smashed there was a lot of bottles that obviously had a lot of smoke damage and things but it never really got particularly hot mm. in there and we knew that because you know you had uh, some things with plastic and you know glad wrap wrapped around yeah, some yeah. labels and, and things like that off. so yeah. yeah but um anyway we obviously as carlos would know it's very hard for you to be uh, reselling wine that's been through a fire and say yeah. it's been beautiful sellered for you yeah. to enjoy it's so a so the insurance uh, the insurance company um you know did a did a sale of the wine that was recovered but um mm -hmm. i did recover a few bottles and one of the bottles i recovered was uh, a special bottle i bought um at auction it was the most expensive bottle of wine i'd ever bought oh, i didn't wow. even tell uh, my karen. wife karen about <laughs> it until uh, actually so years later, how much it actually cost? I think actually at the time of the insurance claim, <laughs> but um, I paid uh, three thousand eight hundred dollars for this bottle of wine. And, and when we put our wine list together originally, it always wanted to have a bottle know, of a representation. Yeah. I wanted to have uh, Pinot and Chardonnay from all around our region, from around mm. Australia, from around the world, so people could explore and understand more about Pinot and Chardonnay. Because mm. back then, unlike now, it certainly wasn't as um, as sort of uh, popular as what they are now as varieties. So, uh, of course, if you're going to do something like that, you want to have a, the pinnacle wine, of course, sitting on the list. So I bought a bottle at Langton's of 2000 Romani Conti. Uh, it's La Romani Conti, Romani Conti. So most expensive... Cruel. 
The, three thousand eight hundred. Yeah, three thousand eight hundred dollars. Oh <laughs> how did you get that at that price? Well, it was uh, that was what? the that was oh, so the price. It's a good price. <laughs> yeah, it's a oh, bloody good well, price. I thought price. it was crazy at the time. Right. Yeah, I mean, and I, uh, that's a really thought, good price. That's, yeah. You, so I was um, so I had I had this on the list. So I thought, well, what do I put it on the list for? So I put it on originally. I think for. I think for four thousand for a short time, then I put it to six thousand dollars, and the prices were going up. So this is in two thousand and six. So you're adjusting the wine list so as the prices rise. As, as we're as we're going through, uh, well, this is two thousand and six when we opened the yep. restaurant. Anyway, and we won, you know, best wine list in Australia and all sorts of different things. Anyway, obviously, I I just I, all I wanted to do is if we sold it, I wanted to be able to replace it, but the replacement value kept going up, oh, of course. and so eventually I had it up at nine thousand dollars, and then. Twelve thousand dollars, and I think it was probably around two thousand and fourteen or fifteen. I was at a wedding, and I had some uh, uh, actually restaurant manager rang and said, um, "Look, I have four guys here. They want to buy the the Romani Conti. Can I can I sell it to them?" And I said, "Well, it's on, it's on the list, of course. <laughs> you know, if you if it's on the list, of course, we've got to be able to you know wow. got to sell it." So, uh, anyway, I went back to the wedding and uh, you know listened to a few speeches, and curiosity just got the better of me, so I ducked out. And I rang, I rang Graham He's back up, it. and I rang up, and I said, "Well, was it corked? <laughs> How did it taste?" He said, "Oh no, they want to take it home." And I said, oh, no, 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 "No, no, yeah, no, no you no, can't no, do that. No, because no, 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 that's going to that. be reselled." Oh, so no, then I yeah. then I looked up on you know Wine Searcher and saw that it, actually the replacement value had gone up to sixteen thousand dollars. Oh, so they just so, a bargain. So they were just looking for a way to yeah, sort of they resell were, it. They were going to resell it. So then I changed the price immediately yeah. after that to sixteen thousand. It went to nineteen thousand. Then. <laughs> Eventually, by the time of the fire, I had it on. I had it on the list for I think twenty eight thousand because I thought I'm never going to replace this wine. Yeah, you can't and, get another and one. And you know right? what? If it doesn't sell, it you know maybe one day I'll drink it or something. And uh, well, we had the fire, and it's like, well, you know, where where is it? Well, it turns out that it was right down the very bottom of all the racks, sitting there perfectly on its own, all wrapped. In you know, in Amazing. Glad Wrap, whatever else, in perfect condition. Um, and Martin's and so, bought that here today, so <laughs> let's crack that open. Let's enjoy it. <laughs> uh, so when we did our final negotiation with the insurance company, of course we were um, you as, as they <laughs> were as they were taking more money off us. Of course, my last my last thing was well, okay, well we'll agree to finish all of this, but I'm keeping the Romani Conti <laughs> for sure. So Fair I enough. still so I still have it. <laughs> nice. So what's sitting the in the cellar. So one day one day what's, we'll get what's, to drink what's the it. one day? Do you have the one day? <laughs> I don't know. It seems as criminal to open a bottle that expensive. Yeah, but yeah, it's, yeah it really uh, does. Yeah. Well, yeah. we is it um, on, so not on the wine list of the no, new ten minutes per track. Not on, not on the wine list anymore. Because no. you, you couldn't still sell it, right? No. Knowing yet. No. Okay, that's no. so cool. Not what after a, it's been through an inferno. What a great story, yeah. man. Yeah. The most expensive bottle of wine ever sold at the restaurant was sixty-one thousand. It was a nineteen ninety Domaine La Romane Conti, really Grand Cru well. Romane Conti. So sixty-one thousand. So, so it's well, all same exact bottle, just same, different vintages. The, yeah, all the vintage. Okay, great. That's all. All right. I know. I know we're short on time, but I'll, I'll tell you. I'll tell you one follow-up story. Yeah, please. In two thousand and seven, we had Aubert de la Vain, um, the owner of uh, Domaine de la Romane Conti, okay. come to Mornington. And, so the uh, owner of this bo- this winery, yes, yeah, wow, big. and uh, we did a tasting of all of the uh, DRC wines. Oh, he bought his except, e- except for except for the Romani Conti, but we did Latash and Rishburg and everything else. And uh, anyway, when I was opening the um, when I was opening the conference in February, I thought I'd go back and just sort of look at uh you know what it cost to do that tasting or what would have cost to do that tasting then without even the romani conti yeah so without the romani conti so i worked out for the 165 people doing that tasting that had worked out at around eighty thousand uh eighty thousand dollars as the cost of the wine at the time which was a big deal it was the biggest tasting you'd ever done anywhere in the world for drc But to do that tasting today, oh, the same good. amount of people, same amount of wine would be over a million dollars. Yeah. Yeah. What? Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's extraordinary. You buy a bottle, you, no, matter, no matter which bottle you buy uh, at yeah. any price, you know that in 10 years it will be yeah. at least double. Yeah. That's wild. That is wild. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. we're wow. digressing. Right. Uh, in front of us, we have uh, two. The Mornington DRC. 
<laughs> That's right. You, um, you can say it, I can't. No. <laughs> so we had no. up the hill, down the hill. Yeah. And now to my right or your left, we yeah. have. What have we poured, Carlos? We've got. Uh, the... So, yeah. So uh, you will have this one. McCutcheon. Uh, which I cannot McCutcheon see. 21. Yeah. On your on your yeah. left. Left. Our left. Our right. the left and the right. Yeah. And then the Cool Art Road. Correct. So what we've got is, again, another up the hill and down the hill. So we're oh, doing cool. up the hill, down the hill, but we're doing it with a single vineyard wine here. So the McCutcheon. Like the best up, <laughs> up and down the hill without exercise I've ever done yeah. in my entire life. Yeah. So I think uh, 21 is a great, is it 21 is a great vintage to be looking at those different. Differences. I think if you remember what we were talking about mm -hmm. before around what those differences are, again, I think when you're looking at the McCutcheon, you know, you see that spice, you see that sort of, there's almost a sort of a, a five spice or, you know, uh, an autumnal type characters, you know, like a autumn leaf that's mm. been sort of crushed. Mm. Um, as you, but, as you said, a little, almost a little bit of mushroomy. Mushroomy, but yeah. more pronounced, much more pronounced as well on this it wine. More much pronounced. more pronounced, much yeah. more intense, much more... Um... I haven't tried them yet, but this is... I can smell this smells unbelievable. <laughs> is this a more premium range to what we just had? Yeah. Mm. Uh, this, okay. Well, this is this. Yeah, this is the next level up. Yeah. This is okay, a single great. vineyard. It, it does smell more complex just yeah. from the nose. Yeah. Yeah, so and you're looking... this is looking... up the hill on the mm. right-hand side? Yes. So same as last time. Yeah, yep. same as last time. But that's specifically from the McCutcheon Vineyard. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think, you know, what you're looking for at that next level in single vineyard is that more concentration, more complexity, more length and persistence with the wine. Um, and, again, you think you see those differences, you know, with the cool art. You know, the cool art has got that um, mm, much more beautiful. brooding sort of, uh, sort of undergrowthy sort of characters it, it does have mushroom as well but it's much more of that darker cherry and for a shiraz like or i suppose you know someone who enjoys those bigger sort of mm. reds you know it's certainly got more assertive tannin which uh which is also lovely and as that wine you can see straight away they're still very young wines 2021 as those uh as the cooler ages you know those 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 tannins become very velvety very plush Love finding out about your winemaking style, but also just getting into a bit of your mind, Martin. It's been really interesting the last couple of episodes, including this one, obviously, but um, to find out how you can hear the passion in what you mm. do, which is incredible, and it's we can taste it. Um, I'm a I'm a business owner, started mm. a company. We're talking about this off the air. Uh, it's not obviously at the scale of ten minutes by tractor, but uh, some things keep you up at night, mm -hmm. and some things make you happy to get out of bed in the morning. Mm -hmm. um, today, what, what's the thing that kept you up at night? You know, obviously, I was going to be last night. Mm. What's the most recent thing that kept you up at night and what, you know, spring you out of bed this morning? Well, it's been a difficult few years. So yep. there's a lot of things that sort of keep you awake, that's for sure. I mean, we've had four really challenging vintages in a row, which is um, – doesn't mean, you know, we've had some great vintages wine-wise. We're drinking the 21 wines, mm, a great vintage. Fantastic. 20, yeah, really 20, 22, yeah. great vintage. Um, but, you know, 2020, we were down 70% on our normal production. 21 mm. was 35%, mm. then another 35%, no, 40% and 22, and probably this year around 50%. So we've lost two vintages in four. So what keeps me up at night at the moment, of course, is that, yeah, we haven't got enough wine to sell. Um, cash flow becomes difficult, and uh, you know, in terms of um, your expenses, don't really change. So, lots of challenges on that. Lots of challenges, you know, around always around you know keeping the team together and finding good new people to help, either in the vineyard or uh, in in the restaurant, cellar door, etc. I think we're um, really fortunate. We've got a fantastic team, a core team, um, you know, winery and cellar and uh, vineyard and things but of course they the they tend the people things of course keep you course. I, I think you worry you the financial aspects the, pa the the things that really you know give you the big step of course is um you know the fun in opening up a bottle of the sv3 or the yeah that was fun or, <laughs> or, <laughs> or, or, or the trahir or or doing this frankly where you get a chance mm. to um you know really to to talk about the wines and uh and the and the pleasure that they can give so we're going to wrap up this episode or part two of this episode with a glass of wine that has been sitting patiently waiting for our lips to press the glass. Um, can you please tell us, I know the vintage is 2015, but what have we got in front of us? Yeah. So I thought what, I thought what would be interesting is to look at um, the Cool Art Road 
Is that uh, our 20, middle? 20, 20, this is down the hill. Down the hill. Yeah, yeah down the hill. Yep. So uh, we've got that one in front of me. So this is where our winery is. It's down uh, in Turong. It looks out over French Island on Western Port. Uh, it's a beautiful vineyard uh, and beautiful gardens there, et cetera. And that's where we build our winery. So we have the 21, which we've been tasting together with the uh, mm -hmm. McCutcheon. Mm -hmm. yep. But next to it now we have the 2015. So we've got a... Um, a contrast there between the 21 and the 15 and the 15, as I said, another sort of classic vintage, you know, lovely bright wines with beautiful sort of, um, you put balance. it in your top vintages as well. That's right. 15 would be, I think probably is still my, be my top vintage. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, no worries by the way, I, mm. just by the way, on the nose. Yeah. Wow. It's so, it's the, I mean, I hate to say terroir, ter terroir, 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 terroir. <laughs> that's that terroir flavor or smell coming through. I haven't even tasted it yet. I'm mm. so excited. Yeah, it's got the, t the 15 obviously has a, um, a oh, component oh. of component of whole bunch. So we've probably got about 20% or so whole bunch there. Um, you know, it's more, you know, it's resolved. It's got uh, obviously those tannins have really softened out. You know, we were talking about before, you can see mm. how those tannins are now a lot softer mm. and more resolved. Mm -hmm. well, it's wow. Got, and it's got some of those, you know, some of those secondary characters coming through. What are your thoughts, Carlos? Yeah, beautiful. I think he's, um, I think very long on the palate, fruity, still, still a lot of fruit going on. Mm. Yeah, there's a lot of tertiary as well, of course, a lot of development, a lot of maturity. You can feel that, mm. but still a very long lingering it's fresh got, palette to it. It's got a little um, touch of soy almost. Yeah, like, uh, yeah, yeah, sort of, yeah, definitely. But, mm, but yeah. The, the palette keeps lingering on a palate for very long. I think that, yeah. that that sharp acidity and, and then the fruit hanging from yeah. both sides is really, really good. Really, really nice. Thank you very much for coming in, Martin. No uh, this has all. been wonderful. Um, not only the wines, there hasn't been a wine that I wouldn't happily drink every day of the week no. and some on special occasions. Yeah. Uh, this has been wonderful. Also, just so much learning. Um, mm. Yeah, there's been the breakdown of clones to uh, <laughs> learning a bit about that fire and especially yeah. that that special bottle. That's um, We'd love to know one day when you do open it, please uh, contact us and just say, <laughs> yeah, it was just me and Karen, whatever, you know. <laughs> well, definitely it'll be Karen and I. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Uh, yeah, it'll be, uh, Maybe the bottle is the occasion. Cheers. 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 Well, cheers to that. I'll let you do that. Cheers.